I'd like to welcome everyone today to the Vasculitis Foundation webinar. I'm Kathy Olevsky, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation educational webinar series, but I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. In today's webinar, we're going to answer some questions about MPA vasculitis. These webinars are part of the Vasculitis Foundation's commitment to patient education, and we would like to thank our sponsors, AstraZeneca, Amgen, and Novartis for supporting these webinars. And we're grateful today to have with us Dr. Christian Panu to answer some patient questions that we couldn't get to in a previously recorded webinar about MPA vasculitis that's currently available on the Vasculitis Foundation's YouTube channel. So welcome, Dr. Peng Yu. We're so happy to have you with us again today. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks you to have me again. It's good to see you. You too. And I should introduce Dr. Peng Yu. He, Dr. Peng Yu trained in internal medicine and clinical immunology in Paris, France, where he created the French Vasculitis Study Group, and he has served as the vice president of this research group. Then he moved to Toronto, Canada in 2010 and was appointed in the Division of Rheumatology at the Mount Sinai Hospital. He joined the steering committee of the North American Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium and founded CANVASC, the Canadian Network for Research in Vasculitis. And he's been involved in many, many important studies in vasculitis. So welcome again to helping us answer some questions, Dr. Panyu. And before we get started, I should ask if you have any disclosures. Uh, well, I've been participating in several steering committees, study committee, including with uh, some companies, Otsuka, GSK, and so on, but nothing that would normally pertain to the topic of today. Okay, thank you so much. So again, these questions came as a result of us having a recorded uh, an entire webinar about MPA vasculitis, and we didn't get to all the questions. So that's what we're gonna start with today. So if it's okay, I'll just jump right in. Perfect. Is, the first one is, is there, is there any skin involvement typically with MPA and how does that manifest if it is? Yeah, so microscopic polyangitis, MPA, is a small vessel vasculitis, as uh, you may remember from the presentation. And so that's uh, the small vessel vasculitis are often associated with skin manifestation more than the large vessel vasculitis, like giant cell arteritis. Uh. So the manifestations are the classical purpura, these red dots, especially on the legs, when there is the declive part of the body, the lower part with the gravity, that's where the vessels are under pressure the most, and, and the leaking of the tiny blood uh, cells going into the skin cause these red dots everywhere, which we call the purpura, that can be necrotic as well. So in microscopic polyangitis, that affects around 20 to 40% of the patients. It's uh, as common as it is in GPA, and it's a little bit less common than it is in eGPA, for example. So there are some diseases where it's more common than others, and MPA would stand in the middle. There are sometimes more severe manifestations. The purpura can be so necrotic that the patients sometimes have some gangrene of the digits uh, that can be that severe. And also sometimes we see what we call livido. Livido is a, an appearance with a kind of a net-like appearance on the skin. That's something you can have, everybody of us, any one of us can have that if you go to the North Pole or if you enter into your fridge and you go out and you will see a kind of a lacy net appearance of red marks, uh, but then it will get better when you get warmer. Uh, but that's uh, due to the vessel vasoconstriction that's a little bit abnormal in patients who have a pathologic livido, uh, a livido that should not be there. So most often purpura, livido sometimes, and sometimes very severe gangrene manifestation. There is no study showing that if you have skin disease, you have more severe or less severe, worse outcome or different outcome. Uh, it's just a major diagnostic parameter. If you come to the doctors and you have this rash on the skin, it will, of course, raise suspicion of vasculitis right away, but it does not mean you will have more problems or more difficulty for your disease to get under control with the treatment. Well, that is very interesting. Uh, and also, this next question is um, something that I hadn't heard before, but is there eye involvement with MPA? So eye involvement in the uh, ANCA-associated vasculitis has been probably a little bit overlooked and uh, 
underemphasized in studies. When we did several studies in France a few years ago, and again recently with the Vasculitis Clinical Consortium, uh, with a colleague in Hamilton, we observed that in MPA, GPA, any GPA, up to 30% of the patients had some eye manifestation. And it's on, not only the classical lacrimal gland involvement or the pseudotumoral lesions that we see in GPA, but in MPA or EGPA, we can see what we call retinal vasculitis. So that's the vasculitis of the back of the eyes, which can, of course, affect the vision. But it can also cause uveitis, that's the inflammation of the anterior part of the eye, so not the back, the retina, but what is before, uveitis, scleritis, and of course conjunctivitis, but conjunctivitis is something we are not too worried about. Some patients can have a little bit of pink eye or red eye just because they are tired, but that's a signal if you have red eye, pink eye, uh, kind of a sen sensation in your eyes, don't forget to mention that to your doctor because they would refer you to the eye doctor to have a more thorough examination of the eyes to look inside because before you can recognize that you have a visual problem, you see floaters or you see blurry vision, the doctors may be able to detect subtle signs of inflammation that may impact the treatment. If you have eye involvement, we consider the eyes as a major organ and that would require sometimes a more intensive treatment as opposed to if you only have some skin manifestation but nothing else. Huh? So it's uh, very uh, important to uh, mention to your doctors if you had any symptoms in the eyes and to consider having an eye examination uh, if needed. How often does it happen? I said 30%. It's not always 30% severe, but it's worth checking because it again uh, impact on the treatment. Such an interesting point you make there because as a patient with MPA vasculitis, I worry about my kidneys and and because I had kidney failure, but the eyes are also a major organ, as you just stated. So that is so interesting. We will have to remind everybody to keep a, an eye on keep an eye on their eyes. <laughs> exactly. I tell my patient all the time that thing, keep an eye on your eyes. Huh? <laughs> but it's also important to, uh, and you know that, or the patient know that, that the treatment also, and of course the corticosteroids can also affect the eyes with the cataract, the glaucoma. So not only it is important to check because of the treatment, but also because of the disease and vice versa. Very interesting. This next question is, do you see any correlation between MPA and ocular migraines? Well, that's uh, kind of an extension of uh, what we just discussed huh, with the eyes. So migraine is not really a sign per se of microscopic polyangitis, but anyone who has migraine would know that if you are diagnosed tomorrow with another disease, an auto-inflammatory disease, an autoimmune disease, it may probably, it will probably impact on the course of your migraines. And you may have more migraines because the remaining of your body is not doing well. Huh? So when you're tired, you have more migraine and you are tired because you have vasculitis, so your migraine gets better, gets worse. Huh? But the migraine per se and visual aura that could go with the migraine are not a classical sign of microscopic polyangitis. That said, if your migraine patterns are changing, if you say, oh, my migraine are different, there are the different space, different place, or they last longer, they are more intense than usual. It's, of course, very important to tell uh, your doctors because microscopic polyangitis can affect the brain and the envelope of the brain, causing meningitis or what we call pachymeningitis, and that can manifest as severe headaches, not the classical migraine, more severe headaches. Uh, so that's why if your migraines, your regular migraines change in their pattern, Tell your doctors because you may, it would be great maybe then to check the eyes, of course, and maybe an imaging of the brain to make sure that there is no inflammation there. It happens rarely in microscopic polyangitis to have brain involvement, less than 5% of the patients, but that happens. And again, that would impact the intensity of the treatment that you require. Very interesting. The, the things that we we just need to remember to tell our doctors everything that's going on with us because it could mean something that we hadn't even thought about. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. This next question is, as a patient with MPA, my kidney health is stable right now, but I worry that one day it will suddenly get worse and I'll be hospitalized. Is it true that once you're in remission, if you're being monitored, it will not come back as aggressively as it did in the beginning? 
That's clearly what we hope for. Uh, we know that uh, ANCA associated vasculitis are diseases that can relapse despite all the good treatments that are available. Today, uh, I would say, and that's what I tell my patients, once you will have completed the induction, the maintenance treatment, and we will at some point even go off treatment, if you've been stable for four to six to eight years, then we stop the treatment, your risk to have another relapse in the next 10 years is probably around 20%, 20-30%. Then there are some parameters. Huh? If you are ANCA persistently positive, if you already had relapses before, there are even more risk of to have another relapse, huh? uh, but these are still playing with numbers. Huh? So instead of 30, it's going to be 35%. But we, we can discuss that individually with our patients, but it's true that relapse can happen. So it's very important to keep monitoring closely everything with blood work, at least every three months initially, urine analysis every three months, and then gradually we can space out. But in my rule of thumb is not to space out more than or less than every six months. Huh? Uh, once a year is uh, really uh, needed. I, I would prefer to have something at least every six months and for years, if not for ever. Huh? We had patients who had been perfectly well for 10 years, 11 years, and then boom, they had a relapse. So it happens. It's true that uh, as it's been shown, a diagnostic delay for the first flare of microscopic polyangitis is on average six months. Because you start to feel crappy, tired, you see some leg edema, and then the kidney gets worse, and then you have the rash. On average, it takes six months before there are signs that would lead to the diagnosis, and then signs that are bad, kidney disease, and so on. Now it's different, because we know the patient has had microscopic polyangitis. So if we see a small change somewhere, there's a big chance that we will catch that early on, so that the disease won't be as severe at the time of the relapse than it was at the very beginning. Uh, but that's, uh, that requires close and continuous monitoring and, uh, and discussion with the doctors. Uh, we receive emails very often or patients contacting us, oh, I feel crappy, what should I do? 90% of the time, it will be nothing, but we do blood work, we check the urine, and then 90% of the time we are reassuring. We say, it's nothing, it's a cold. But it's, you don't want to miss the boat. When there's some signal, it's important to react and check. And most of the time, it will be fine. That is such great information for all of us. And it just kind of reiterates good, consistent follow-up with your doctor and, and let them know how you're feeling each time so that they can run the blood work and make decisions from that. So very important information. The next uh, person says, I'm in remission off treatment. Can I take vitamins and things? I heard that I shouldn't try to strengthen my immune system, but that's how I lived my life before diagnosis to prevent the flu and colds and viruses. Yeah, so that's a very good question. There's a little bit of a trickiness here. It's true that uh, when we discuss about microscopic polyangitis, we call that as an autoimmune disease. So your immune system has become a little bit, I say sometimes crazy, overactive. So the idea to boost your immune system is kind of counterintuitive here and we give immunosuppressant. So why would we boost the immune system on one end and depress it on the other end? But vitamins act on a different level. So uh, vitamins are, for all of them, pretty safe as long as you take them at the recommended doses. And you know that uh, I personally like the vitamin question because we conducted not so long ago a study on vitamin D, uh, which showed that uh, it's not good to be low on vitamin D. Better you take it to be normal and maybe it impacts a little bit things. And it's probably the same thing for the other vitamins. You don't want to have a deficiency in any vitamins. That's what is important. You don't need to take more than what is recommended and what is needed. Uh, so it's not needed to take 10 gummies of vitamin per day, but taking your one gummy per day to make sure you're normal for everything is a good idea. Boosting more than that is not only not needed, can be dangerous, not really because of a flare of the vasculitis. It has never been shown that vis vitamin would cause a flare of, uh, of the vasculitis, uh, but better to take what is recommended as dosing. Yeah, I, I love that answer. <laughs> I, I want to take vitamins, so that um, lets me know the right way to do it. So I appreciate that. And then this final question is, I have MPA, which is in remission. I've just been diagnosed with ITP. 
how worried should I be and what is ITP? Mm -hmm. So ITP is idiopathic or immunological thrombocytopenia. Huh? So it's a platelet count that is low because there's an autoimmune antibody here, another one that's uh, attacking and destroying the platelets. So that's another autoimmune disease. There's no direct connection between microscopic polyangitis and ITP, but these are both autoimmune disease. And we know uh, that indeed patients who have one autoimmune disease are more predisposed or more prone to have one day another autoimmune disease. Mm. How often does it happen? I would say probably in around 10%, 13% of our patients. But most of the time, it's a different type of autoimmune disease. And the most common one, we did studies with the VCRC here, was the thyroid, hypothyroidism, autoimmune hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, is probably the most common other autoimmune disease that we see in patients with ANCA-associated vasculitis. And it's pretty simple to treat autoimmune uh, hypothyroidism. We just give thyroid hormones because there's no need for steroids. Uh, the thyroid is a bit impacted. We give uh, thyroid hormone and then we stabilize the thing. But patients can develop other autoimmune disease, ITP, uh, rarely lupus, rarely scleroderma. When we look at the big uh, cohort studies that have been done around association between MPA and another thing, we end up with cohorts, international cohorts of 10, 30 patients maximum. Huh? So it happens. There's a predisposition uh, characteristic there, but it still remain rare, uh, maybe more than just a coincidence, huh? but not a classical association. Clearly, patients with MPA should not worry too much about having something else thereafter. We know what to measure, especially the thyroid, but there's no big risk to have ITP, uh, FSGS, uh, another autoimmune disease that can affect a different organ. Uh. Okay, well, thank you for clearing that all up. And that is were the rest of the questions that we didn't get to in the previously recorded MPA vasculitis webinar that we did. And so I'd like to thank you for taking your time with us today, Dr. Penyu. And You're welcome, thank you. We also want to thank the Vasculitis Foundation for hosting these medical webinars and our sponsors, Amgen, AstraZeneca, and Novartis. Thank you, Cathy.